Hello and welcome to all you digital makers out there. We're talking about getting creative in the classroom this week on Digital Making at Home. If you haven't already, say hey in the chat and let us know where in the world you are. I'm Mr. C and I'm coming to you live from Cambridge in the UK and back with us as always is my fellow cyber samurai, Christina. Hey, Christina. Hey, Mr. C. Hello, everyone. Does anyone else have a dance for the beginning of the stream? Because I, I, I started creating one. I'm joining from Nebraska in the USA. And thank you to everyone joining from all over the world for another great episode of Digital Making at Home. Great to see you, Mr. C. Great to see you too. We already have folks in the chat saying hello. Hello to Tony C in Australia. Great to have you joining us. Oh, hello to VHAW Wildeman in the Netherlands, Canada, Larry. Oh, hello, Ali. So great to see you. Oh, we love seeing everyone um, from all over the world. Now, our special guest this week is an old friend of the foundation here in the US, Nick Provenzano, also known as the Nerdy Teacher. He's a Google certified innovator, Raspberry Pi certified educator, TED Ed innovative educator, Sphero hero, Minecraft mentor, and a veritable guru on the best practice in education. I'm so excited. And he's here this week to talk about being creative in the classroom and making computer science interesting and fun for students. Yeah, I'm really excited to chat with him. I mean, we've never met, but I know Nick's work. I'm excited to speak with him in the making section of the show about one of the projects on our site that he's well known for delivering, the Python RPG. It reminds me of Zork, so like a really old text-based dungeon game that I love, a bit like D&D &D or one of those fighting fantasy novels, but on your computer coded in Python. And so his own example, which he calls Escape from Werewolf House, is amazing. Uh, we'll post a link a bit later on showing you where to get the instructions for the code. Link. <clears throat> for those of you who are with us for the first time this week, Welcome. Digital Making at Home is all about getting young people to reach out and change the world around them with technology. Every Wednesday, we make cool gadgets together. We see amazing digital making projects from young people worldwide, and we chat with incredible inventors and makers from all over the globe. And every week, we love having you all here with us making, inventing, and chatting about tech. We broadcast every episode live to YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. All of your comments and questions pop up in front of us during the stream, and we love hearing from everyone during the show. Feel free to jump in, ask questions, chat with each other, or just let us know your opinion on something during the show. Definitely, we love hearing from the crowd. Whenever someone corrects one of our mistakes or supports another digital maker in the chat, has a great question to ask us or our guests, we love sharing your contributions. So keep the comments and questions rolling in. Uh, nice to see my dad getting in early in the chat today. Great to have you and mum making with us again this week. Uh, also, make sure to like and subscribe on YouTube, everybody. It really does help us out. Or head to rpf.io slash sub to get all our content fresh off the press. Yes, speaking of fresh off the press, subscribe. We just hit 4,000 subscribers, and you can be one of them. We are a community, an incredible community of makers, teachers, and learners. And we're really global. Like, look in the chat. We've got folks from all over the world joining us in the chat today. And I want to definitely acknowledge our return excuse me, returners, I'm so excited. And if you're new, let us know. We love welcoming new folks to this awesome community. Uh, we're a community of creators coming together to change the world with digital making. Subscribe and join this digital making adventure. Speaking of adventures, shall we bring Nick on now and have a chat with him? Yes, Nick, are you there? Hey! hey! <laughs> T-shirt twin! Yeah, T-shirt twin. Thanks for joining us today. I'm so excited to be here. And yes, I have a dance while you wait. You just kind of go and <laughs> run it along. Nice. Yeah. yeah oh, I, I'm up. so excited. Oh my goodness, to be doing anything with Raspberry Pi, uh, you know, Coder Dough just makes me so happy. Uh, it makes my heart so excited because, uh, as as a teacher. You know, my main mission is just to help uh, kids, anyone learn. And, you know, Pi has the exact same mission. It's just, you know, we want people to learn and have fun. And so uh, having worked with you guys in different capacities uh, and taking what I've learned uh, to be part of it has me so excited because I, I started off as a dyslexic English teacher who didn't know how to code. Uh, I go to a single Pi Academy and all of a sudden, you know, I can kind of code. <laughs> so it's kind of amazing. So Thank you for sharing that. Yeah, like I think you have been with us for such, I and mean, we've known each other for a couple years now. Yeah, it feels yeah. like and I definitely feel like you, you are just definitely like a Raspberry Pi family member for sure. Uh, I, mean, I know there's actually there's a picture of you in the Cambridge office. Which is I've like been, I've heard about that. Yes, and the yeah. the, the famous uh, uh, GIF of me fist pumping. If you've yes. seen that one, uh, that's from the uh, that was the first American Pi Academy. 
So I was there and that was me making a light blink for the first time. And that was a genuine bit of excitement. So for people who think it's fake, I was that excited because I tell you, I tell students this, making a light blink with code for the first time is one of the most epic feelings that you can have when you get into computer science and digital making because you all of a sudden control all of this power. It goes straight to your head. Like if I can make a light blink, I can do anything. And so uh, I, I make sure I show that to my students because uh, we all start somewhere and, and making a light go on and off an LED uh, is the first step to like a wonderful world of amazing possibilities. Definitely. Yes, there's exactly. a, a whole generation of young people who have had everything locked away from them, like all of our iPhones, all that sort of stuff. It's just locked away and you can't get to the electronics. But that magic of being able to control the machine and like being in charge again, I think that's a big thing for kids too. And like you're really well known around the US, like when it comes to teaching computing and digital making. And why do you think it's so important for kids to get involved and develop these sorts of skills? Well, I think it's one of the things I tell kids, especially, you know, in, in teachers about like coding in particular is that, you know, my job isn't to make every single student a coder, like that's going to be their career. My job is to help them sort of understand how we solve problems, right? What are the steps, the order of operation that make things work? Because the way that you solve a problem for coding is essentially the same way you'll solve a problem if something's not working and something that you're building, whether it's like a woodworking project or let's say you're you know making something out of Legos. Like as you problem solve, you're just essentially going to take those same steps. And so for me, digital making and physical making uh, share so many of the same elements when it comes to problem solving. And so that those kids that are in my class that are working on coding projects, they can take a step back when they encounter a project in math or social studies class where they can go, okay, well, how can I go about solving this problem with these steps? And I think it's about learning that process that's so important, you know, the critical thinking uh, and problem solving skills that really are becoming the most important skills for kids to have. Almost no matter what career you choose, you need to be able to think on your feet and come up with possible solutions to potential problems and not just the problems that are in front of you. Absolutely. And so then do you think that that sort of creative side of digital making is the really important part for kids to develop as well? Do you think there's any sense of it falling by the wayside being a problem? Uh, the creative part is so important. So like I said, I spent 16 years as an English teacher. That's where I'm trained in. And that's where I went to school. Uh, and as I mentioned, I'm, I'm dyslexic. And I didn't even know that until college. I just knew reading was like really tough for me. Uh, so even the idea of coding was ridiculous to me. I mean, so I have to type a whole bunch of stuff out and it has to make sense. I'm like, I can't do that on my own with regular writing. I'm supposed to do that with lines of code. Uh, but it really empowered me. And it's something I share with students because it empowers them. And, you know, when you think of coding, you think of computer science, you don't think about language arts. You don't think about, you know, your literature class, right? And one of the things that I worked hard in this lesson that we're going to talk about is part of that is that it can be anywhere, you know, computer science can be anywhere. And I, I love to say more than anything is that, you know, code will make it work. The arts will make it beautiful, right? So you right. can code anything, right? You can have a computer that could do all the stuff, but if you need someone to design it, you need someone to say, well, this is what it's going to look like. And this is how, you know, the form and function of it. So even those kids that say like, well, coding's not for me, I go, you might not want to code, but someone's got to design those video game characters. Someone has to design the world in which they live in. And that's part of the process too. So even when we have kids that are coding and we'll jump and use um, MakeCode Arcade, which is another great resource, oh, arcade.makecode.com, where it's just drag and drop blocks, but they're characters and you can actually create your own pixel characters if you want to take the time. So having kids understand that there's a place for the arts in, you know, computer sciences and things like that digital making is so key because i firmly believe that all types of making needs to be as inclusive as possible you want as big of a tent as you can have and telling people that what they're doing is not part of that for me is the antithesis of what making is all about and so that's mm -hmm. one of the things i really emphasize with teachers and students yeah and you also have introduced like physical computing into your classroom can you talk about like what you've been making with students what you've done this past school year yeah, so this past school year has been nuts, <laughs> like a lot of, of people. Of course, yeah. Shout uh, out to all the educators. Shout out yes, to you. Yes, yes. 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 All the teachers out there. So I was hybrid. So I was in the classroom 
and I would have students in front of me and I would still have students that were online as well. So wow. it caused, you know, trying to teach kids on a computer and the kids in front of you uh, was a nightmare. I'm not going to pretend like, oh, it wasn't that bad. No, it was awful. But it was still the best situation that we could. And I give credit to all the parents and teachers and students that made that situation as best as you can. And so when it came to digital projects, it was always I had to be ready to switch because one day I might have three quarters of the class out for quarantine. Um, and I just, that's it. Okay, we're guess we're going to do digital baking. Uh, with physical uh, computing, we, we use a lot of Spheros. Uh, so coding Spheros, the robots, to traverse mazes that they built and learning how to code uh, to move an object left, right, up, down, or around a map that they've sort of created. Uh, we had kids using micro bits uh, to sort of code and, and build and sort of use some of the uh, sensors on those and uh, because of uh, chip shortage and whatnot, my Raspberry Pi order has been delayed again. Because getting, <laughs> getting, getting, getting my hands on Pi. That. Right? No, no, you don't know anyone? You guys can't? No? Okay. Uh, but that's, but that, I'm looking forward to this next year because when things are a little bit more normal, we're really going to dive into uh, what is possible uh, with Raspberry Pi. Like, I've done a magic mirror before. Uh, where you can put that together and have like the, the information on a magic mirror. And I know the kids are really excited to dive into more complex projects that will allow more, I don't know, shoulder to shoulder collaboration that just wasn't mm -hmm. possible this year. Uh, but, you know, it, it really, it's, it sparked the interest of the kids that my middle school students that were sixth graders have signed up to take my level two design class because they know now that, okay, we're going to get to do like that next level, get our hands dirty stuff. And I think, again, the idea that I want to convey to kids is that there's always going to be a physical element to our digital making. And you always want to be able to combine those two because you want to understand how one impacts the other. Like if you want to create something that uh, like sort of an example that I, I got here is my little airplay. I made a, uh, a Raspberry Pi oh, yeah, airplay. A uh, little, little lid there, and you can sort of oh, see the pie and I love the that you're there too. I love that. Oh, it's it's important to me. If I'm going to teach kids to make, I need to show them what I'm making. I like to keep a board that it, I update co consistently. That's this is what I'm working on right now. This is what I'm making. And sometimes it's a, a digital physical hybrid. Sometimes it's just a physical piece. I'm making a table. I'm like, I always want to make a table uh, because I want to show the kids that making is part of real life. Like you can have a job, you can have a family, you can go to school and you can make things. And, yeah. you know, that's what's important to me to show that it's not a separate entity, like a silo in your life that's school only and I'm going to do computer stuff and that's it. It's a part of, you know, everyday life that you want to do. And I'm also a gamer. I also do, you know, I built a pond in my backyard that I take care of. Like <laughs> it, it, it can be all of these things and, you know, I want to encourage the kids that. So it's important to keep them, I guess, aware of what I'm doing as hopefully an example to them that, oh, well, I guess I can do that in my spare time too. Yeah, yeah. It's just another set of tools that you can have to make your life better, right? It's just a way of skilling up your life with a whole different set of tools. And I think moving forward into sort of the digital ages, we're doing that. That's becoming more and more important, right? Like everything that you do is kind of digital. Like we've done, I'm sure all of us sitting here have like been on a shop today. We've sort of done emails today. We've communicated. We've done work. All these things that are online. And I think if you don't start to understand that, then you are in pretty big trouble, I think, as it comes up. I mean, when you talk about doing stuff in your own life, what sort of things do you make for yourself? How ways, like, what ways do you still up your life at home? Then? So it's, it's almost like the soup of the day for me. It is whatever is catching my attention that I'm like, oh, I'm going to work on that. And that's it. I have so many things bookmarked on my phone or my computer of potential projects. Uh, but sometimes they come from like random places. I was at a two, three years ago, I was at like a flea market and I saw an old school um, lunchbox, like the old school metal ones. Uh, it was a, you know, it's a gremlins lunchbox. I'm like, oh, <laughs> yeah. I'm, Eat cuts, that's awesome. Right, I mean, look at that. I got my Pi Academy sticker on there. I mean, of this course. is old school metal and it just sat in my little workspace and I'm like, I'm gonna do something with that. And then Pi released their uh, own touchscreen. So I was like, oh, that looks like 
the exact size of the lunch. I go, I wonder if that could fit. I was literally lying in bed. It was like the morning <laughs> and like a Sunday. And I go, maybe it will. And I go down there and I measure it. I go, oh, I could build a computer in a lunchbox. I got so excited. And I'm like, I'm going to do all of these things. And so I have two now. I have one and a Thundercats one as well. Uh, so you can see my really sweet <laughs> Thundercats oh, yeah. uh, one, which is I'm super excited about because I wanted to upgrade. But my original, I love. Let me get, open this bad boy up here. Yeah, uh, open it up. Let's see it. So I've got, I put the camera on it too. So I've got Ooh. a camera. Uh, I've got a little ports there so I can plug in as needed, a wireless keyboard. Uh, it's just a battery pack, just like you, know, you would charge like your phone or something right. with. Um, but what I love about it, where is it here? Um, it's so easy for me using the micro SD cards just to swap out what I want it to be. So I can swap out, um, you know, an emulator and I can play like computer games on this as much as I want. It's something I can do. But on the handle, it's probably the thing I'm most proud of. You can sort of see there's a button right here. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yes, yes, I see it. All right, so that's a shutdown button I coded. Um, yeah. That was what I was most excited about is that I'm like, oh, I can just click this button and it'll run a shutdown code, which I had to learn how to do a shutdown code. The bad part of it, though, is when I've traveled with this, the TSA is not super excited about a metal box yeah. with a little button on the outside. So I yeah. spend a lot of time explaining and having to show them that this is a computer and a lunchbox. Right. Yeah. Uh, but it is it is something that I love to showcase and travel with, despite the pain that it is, mm -hmm. uh, because it, it inspires a lot of teachers to go, oh, like, I didn't think that that could be a mm -hmm. thing. And I go, yeah, I didn't think anybody thought that that could be a thing until it's like a thing. And then, you know, once you start to piece it all together, you're like, oh, like, what a simple project and again this is something that is awesome about pie and it's always been is that it's so easy to purchase a pie you can get one mm -hmm. at a great price and have at it and i you know i've definitely burnt out a few pies by connecting things that should have been connected but i'm like okay it's not a whole crazy uh expense to purchase all of these pies so uh it's great to uh, learn on and fail on is something that i think is really important to know too right. How many do you have? Colin from YouTube wants to know oh. how many pies do you have? Jeez. Uh, I, I know I have some of the original, original pies in my house. Uh, I've got, oh my goodness. I easily can say if I had to guesstimate, I have at least around 30 pies in oh, some wow. store <laughs> like in the, the, that, are, that are doing something, that are mm -hmm. planned to be done something. Mm -hmm. uh, I've, I've put, <laughs> I've, man, I put the pie zero in an old Nintendo cartridge and turned it into an emulator uh, that plays the game that was in the Nintendo cartridge. So I stripped it, opened it, placed it in, and add the components. Uh, I've made my own Amazon Alexa using Raspberry Pi nice. uh, as part of that. Uh, I use them to run the monitor at, at our school. It's like one of the first things I did at my new job three, four years ago was they had this really old computer running this you know, information board. And I'm like, that's ridiculous. I go, I'm adding a Pi. I'm going to VNC into that thing. And I go, it's going to set it all up and it's just going to run uh, these very simple slides in Chromium. And everyone's like, whoa. I go, yep, cost me like 40 bucks. Just put it into there and set it all up. And it it just runs all day. Uh, so it's it's been fun to see even sort of integrate that in, even into my job to show other teachers like how simple this is because I still think some people don't think of Pi as like a computer, right? Like mm -hmm. they, it, it's one of those things where they still think it's like, oh, it, it like does a thing ago. It can do all the things if you just tell it the things to do. So uh, yeah, so I have a lot of Pies that are just waiting and uh, trying to figure out. So whenever they upgrade it. Oh, I, their next adventure. <laughs> oh, my next adventure. Uh, I, geez, it's, it's so tough. There's some things that I wanted to, to sort of go back to like one of the things I love about making is that, right, your first attempt at something might work, but come back to it six months later and you might go, wow, I can do that way better than I did the first time around because you've learned so much. And, you know, with my job as a makerspace director and a teacher, I'm just continually learning like all year. So even projects where, again, making this out of wood, this is like my third iteration. 
like, and I'm very lucky. I have a laser cutter. So I like design this and then cut the holes out on oh, the wow. side. So Beautiful. the speakers can go through. Yeah, right. Really and you know, the, the little back parts so the wires could come out and I love it. But also the first, second, third version of it were just so bad. I'm just like, I can do this better. I can like my first version of an airplay was actually in a Tupperware container. Like I just put everything in and yeah. stuck it in a Tupperware container. I'm like, Budge. this yeah. counts. <laughs> I was like, I, mean, I can go back. So it's not even so much what my next project will be. I like to just sort of like reassess. Like I have two lunchbox computers now. I, I don't know why. I would argue I don't need one, but I've got two now. And the second one is way nicer and cleaner. And, you know, it's just been put together better than the first one. And I think what I like to show with my students in particular is that there's always room for growth, right? Mm -hmm. There's always, you might have done something once, but, you know, waiting and doing it again to make it better, to improve upon, you know, the iteration process is so important to my classroom is that it's okay. If you feel like you're good, you feel like you're in a good space, can you make it better? And yeah. let's go for that. And that's why for me, my middle school class is so important that it's ungraded because once you add a grade to something, it, 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 it's, it has an air of like finality to it. Like, yeah. it's, well, I've received a B, I'm done. But when there are no grades, I get to ask the kids, are you happy with it? And if they are not, I go, okay, have another go. And they, and they get to. And, it, and again, the emphasis, of course, that is on learning and not about, you know, finishing. And I think that's an important mm -hmm. thing that I try to express to teachers and students when we do digital making, physical making, because we want to make it about the process and not about necessarily the end product. Definitely. Oh, for sure, yeah. I, I know I've been reflecting on that as an adult, as I've been learning new things and have been not, because as a kid, you're supposed to get it right the first time. You have to do this assessment and then you're supposed to just get an A and if you don't, then you've failed. And how important failure is. We talk about that all the time. We talk about so much in digital making at home that like, I'm, I've started really truly finding that I get excited by failure because it means I've learned something and I know mm -hmm. what to do next. And that is such an, an important thing. Now, Nick, I want to be mindful of time because we've got you. We've only got you for a little bit of time. Can we? Let's talk about uh, Escape from Werewolf House. Can we talk yes. about that? Yes, uh, absolutely. Yeah. Um, so I found through the Raspberry Pi website uh, the RPG Maker, and uh, like you had mentioned about Zork, I remember Zork too. Like I remember all those text-based uh, games is like the, the beginning of computer gaming. And, uh, when I found this, I went through it. I'm like, Oh, this is fun. I'm like, this is kind of like a cute like introduction to like, so again, order of operation, how things work. And the first thing I did was I brought it to our sixth grade English teacher. I said, Hey, you're always up for something new. What if we worked on, you know, writing skills and proofreading skills doing a, a text-based computer game. She's like, really? I go, I'll be there every single class to help you through it. And I go, and I'll build my own game as an example. So Escape from Werewolf House is a ridiculous game where you end up in the attic of this house that is like haunted and then there's like a weird myth about werewolves or stuff like that. And you have to navigate yourself through the house, find certain objects, uh, to protect yourself and to escape through the front door. Now, one of the things I love about this RPG is that the, the directions are awesome in Raspberry Pi. They really walk you through how to do this. And shout then, shout out to the content what, team. Shout out to that. Yeah, sh yeah. Shout out to the content team because uh, I've fallen in love with this because once I did the structure right, the bones are all there for you, and then you fill in a lot of the blanks. But then it teaches you why things work. And then I was able to experiment and add my own elements to it. So the basically now, every time you in my game, you walk into a room, a full description of the room will appear. So I learned how that works in the code. I also figured out, oh, go east, west, south, north, and those type of things are there. But what about up and down? Like, what if there were stairs? How do I do stairs? And I figure out how to do stairs. And I'm like, oh, you can go stairs. And then I, I taught myself how to code traps into rooms. So if you search for treasure, but there's a trap instead of a treasure, you'll get killed. Unless you have the special amulet that you find that'll protect you from traps. It's like all of these if statements, right? And that's what you sort of learn so for many. those of you, right? So many if statements. <laughs> and the reason I love Trinket, and so for people that find uh, this, you can find it on my website, there's a full 
um, actual tutorial on the first post on there where I did a webinar that I'll walk you through how to do it completely. Uh, but learning essentially how to do all of those if statements and how they impact in the order those if statements are have to be like learning that operation. So all of I have, I believe around 48 something rooms. I think I ended up coding total with all the different little aspects of it. And I rolled this out to the English class. And the most important thing that we got out of it is how carefully kids realized they had to proofread, right? Mm -hmm. As you all know, a misplaced comma in code is going to crash the entire thing, right? If you don't have a comma in the right place or a misplaced indentation, if that's wrong, right, the whole code will crash. And so be able to take those computer science concepts and then transfer those over to a language arts course, they actually mirror. We tell the kids to go, for someone who knows how to read really well, if you have an indent in the wrong spot, that means it's not a paragraph. And that's weird for us. Like it causes us to break down as the reader when it comes to code. Or you're missing a comma and we're reading and we go, oh, there should be a comma, look what's going on. Like that causes us as the reader to sort of crash. And so for the sixth graders, it really got them to think about coding and writing as something very similar. And of course, with a text-based game, you have to create a narrative. You know, it's, it's sort of like a choose your yes. own adventure style thing. So now it also brought in those kids who are like, I'm not a coder, but I'm like, someone's got to create the story. Every game that you play has a story. And so the story can be whatever you want. And so uh, an eighth grader this year, it took it upon herself to create a hundred room game that wow. is based on some weird type of mathematical formula and the rooms actually don't connect in a sort of linear fashion. You go left from one room, it'll take you to a completely different part of the building. Like she decided that she's gonna really embrace this and make the hardest game possible. Uh, I, she's promised it'll be finished this summer. Uh, and I was like, <laughs> crazy. I'm like, I, but I saw her and she was writing the description of every single room. And it's just okay. this beautiful moment where kids can learn and they can go off in any direction they want. Yes, yeah. yes. And you mentioned the art piece too. So I'm curious, like, are the kids drawing out their rooms? Are they drawing out the worlds as well? Yes. I feel like I'm such a visual person. You mentioned this, mm -hmm. and I'm like, I would actually, I would need to draw a map for me if, if I was creating. Yeah, and that's part of required part of the assignment is that they have to draw the map first, show it to me, and sort of like walk me through how this works. Because many of us are visual learners. Like I had to draw a map, and I had all these little squares, and I labeled everything, and the different arrows, and which way you could go. Because when you're trying to code a set of rooms, right? If this room A goes east to room B, well, room B going west has to go back to room A, in theory. But right, this this other student, she's just said, I'm going to throw that out the door, and it's going to be a completely crazy thing, uh, which I love because it's, again, a kid taking something that I did and saying, I get it, but I want to make it my own, and I'm going to do this. And it's one of the things that I encourage with my students all the time is that come up to me and say, Mr. P, I know what you want me to do, but I want to do this, and here's why. And I encourage it. I want them to say, eh. But this will be better. And I'll be like, because you could totally be right. And then I might take your idea and make it <laughs> this time and next time around. Because as a teacher, you have to be comfortable with feedback that says this could be better. Even if it comes from a sixth grader or a fellow teacher, uh, we can all be better. And so there's a lot of things like in this lesson and other lessons where kids have said, well, why not try it this way? I'm like, that's like just say five hours of class time. Yes, that is a way better way to do that. So you have to be open to that. Yeah, Absolutely. I feel like that must be such a fun. I've never, I have never taught in a makerspace setting, but like to be in that setting, yeah, and just it's not just you're not just teaching. You're actually in a room full of folks who are thinking and being creative. So there's actually a lot of solutions and a lot of folks failing. So you're learning mm -hmm. so much more that way, which is such an incredible space to be in. And I, I miss those spaces. I can't wait to return to those spaces. That's, yeah, that's and, really awesome. well, and they're, and they're so naturally collaborative. Those spaces, right? Like mm -hmm. anyone will wander over and go, "Oh, what are you working on?" Oh okay, hey, well, here, can you hold this? Yeah, I'll hold this. Let me do this. They go, whoa. And all of a sudden, those kids get that feedback as well. So it's different from a traditional classroom where it's generally the teacher like walking around and has to be the one to provide the feedback. But in a makerspace, in a collaborative environment like that, it's all about everyone supporting everyone. And again, when you eliminate grades, you also eliminate competition. Even though grades 
are in a competition, some kids treat like, well, if I get an A, that kid can't get an A, like, which is insane. But again, the way grades have sort of warped the idea of learning, you know, when you eliminate that, all of a sudden, kids are way more helpful to one another. And, you know, again, it speaks volumes to what grading can do, but also, you know, how it can hurt creativity. When you have yeah, more yeah. kids supporting one another, you can create an environment that is just conducive to solving problems. Definitely. Yes. I mean, speaking Period. of solving problems, <laughs> um, so I was tinkering with the RPG earlier, and so I've made a few more rooms. Like you can see, I don't know if you can see my shared code here. I might make my writing yeah. a bit bigger just so you guys can see it a bit easier. There we go. So you can see here, I've got my rooms, the regular ones, and I added an armory, which I thought was a really cool idea from Werewolf House. I thought that's cool. I love yes. that idea. <laughs> Being a Dungeons and Dragons nerd, I thought I'm going to add an armory. So uh, you can see here, everybody, so the rooms are all listed in this. Di it's a dictionary of rooms, right? So this is the room that you're in, and then it tells you that you can go south to the kitchen or north to the armory, which is with I added uh, my own one, east to the dining room, and then there's an item in this room that is the key. And so we can change those. Uh, to make sure that you can pick up those keys, you can see those things, and you can the, the program itself knows which way to go. So when you say go south, it goes, okay, from the hole, you'll now be in the kitchen. I've got that right, don't I, Nick? I've explained that. Yes, that way. That perfect, cool. yeah. Cool. And so I added the armory, and then I tried to be clever, and I thought I'll add shiny sword, and it freaked out on me. Yeah. Because I, and so I'm trying to backtrack my – I added a bug into my story. I'm like, why is this not working? It's because I've used two split strings, isn't it? Yes, absolutely. Yep, yeah, that's it. So, uh, and that was a problem that we encountered with students as well, uh, because they want to they want to give an adjective to everything. I go, you can, but going and the best part is, is with my code, I share it with them. I go, look at my code because I had that exact same problem, and this is the code that you need to put into there so that if you have uh, a two worded item or something like that you have to have a, this code in here to pick it up so that it'll grab it. So my code, I had to build that into there so that if it had it, um, as well, the other thing, kids want to put apostrophes on things. I go, well, in code, an apostrophe isn't necessarily an apostrophe. You need the forward slash yep. for the apostrophe so that it reads it as an apostrophe. And so the kids will go, that's ridiculous. I go, it seems ridiculous, but that's how the code has to work because the apostrophe already has a job. And That's so right. that job is t telling, you know, the, the code that this between these two things is something important. You know, if you want to say, oh, I'm just using this apostrophe for this, you add the forward facing slash uh, to sort of help them understand that. So it's nice for kids to see under the hood because, you know, I explained to them, I go, well, your favorite games on Xbox, PlayStation, whatever, are written with Python, but it's all text based code that someone had mm -hmm. to sit and write in. A lot of these rules are very similar. So when you watch your game play and you move your controller and your character goes up, I go, it's really not that different from you coding, you know, when button press, move up. I go, that's essentially what it is. And so it empowers the kids to go, oh, well, maybe I can do that. Oh, you yeah. gave yourself a health bar too. Look at you. <laughs> right. Right. So, get, get enough. so yeah, so I've got the army, right? I can see my sword. So I'm going to get my sword because I added... It was shiny sword, and then it did my weird bug, so I fixed that now. So it's just sword. So I've got my sword. Yay! Right, and so I added a bit so that if I have the sword in my inventory, check it. If I have the sword in my inventory, <laughs> uh, here we go. And I'm in the garden, which is uh, if I have the key and the potion uh, and the monster, I get another ending. So I set up a thing where if I have the sword on my in my purse in my inventory when the monster attacks me, okay, so if I don't have the sword, I die. If I yep. do have the sword, I whack it with my sword and then it sits yep. down and then I can take it into my inventory and then I get a special ending whereby I ride my monster off into the sunset. <laughs> <laughs> the creativity, the imagination. Oh, I, love, I it. love it. Oh, that's so great. And the kids, you know, when they are start to really dive into this, they, they ask me a lot of those like similar questions. Well, can I do this? I go, well, it's possible, but we're going to have to figure out how to code it. I go, and that's part of that process. So I love, again, those even elements that you added, right, that aren't in the tutorial. But once you understand the tutorial, you understand the concepts, it's very easy to start to add those elements here and there to really personalize it. And the kid's like, well, I, I can make it outside. It doesn't have to be in a house, right? I go, it could be in space. It could be underwater, right? Like, the game, the code doesn't know what a house is, right? Like it's getting kids also to understand that, you know, you could call, you could make up gibberish and the game will go, oh, they typed in, 
you know, DFGH, that means go this direction. Okay. So like having them understand that the code only does what you tell it to do and that it isn't smart. You're the smart person. You're the one telling it what to do. And so, and again, it empowers those kids to go, Oh, I'm the reason it does this. Like the code isn't like the reason I tell it what to do. And so when they start to understand the power of a single line of code or how a single extra word can throw everything off, it makes them a little bit more diligent and they can actually start to have a little bit more fun with it too, which is what I love. Yes. And all, these would be such fun like assignments to assess and like give feedback on. I can't, I can only imagine just like the creativity and the energy and Nick, like, thank you so much for joining us oh. and sharing about this project. Seeing folks who are like excited in the chat, make sure to check out Nick's website. You can get, he's got a great webinar on there about how to bring this project to life in your classroom. And Nick, thank you so much for joining us today. We'll send you a big virtual hug. We'll talk. To oh you yes. Big virtual hugs. Thank you everyone. Uh, it's an honor and check it out you guys you'll love all the stuff that you can find and keep watching like and subscribe what are you doing why aren't you liking <laughs> yes, and subscribing <laughs> get on top of that so i'll talk to you guys later have fun see you later bye thanks very much Nick. Oh, oh, amazing what a great project and what just a fun way to like play with python now if you're just getting started on your digital making journey the raspberry pi foundation we we're here to help you out Check out our huge library of free maker content at projects.raspberrypi.org to find lots more of awesome projects and tutorials. Want to learn how to make an RPG in Python? That project is there. Do some machine learning, code some HTML, take pics with a Pi camera. There's so many great projects at projects.raspberrypi.org. And yeah, it's so oh, great. And they're all translated a bunch of different languages. I was going to say it's translated. We've got a really great translation team. Actually, they don't get shouted out enough. So shout out to our worldwide translation team who do so much great work for us on all of our projects. And it was great to see so many of you getting involved this week in the chat, everybody. Shout outs to Colin and Paul, uh, Alex, for your great contributions to the discussion. Thank you, everyone. And thank you to Nick for coming on to speak with us about making classroom computer science compelling and exciting. Yes, yes. I'm, I've, I've got to give a shout out to Pancake Factory One, who is the biggest fan of Raspberry Pi accordingly. We're so <laughs> glad you're here on Twitch. Thank you so much for joining. Now, that's all we have time for this week, but we want to see what you're making. Send us an email at dmah at raspberrypi.org to get in touch with us, and maybe we'll feature your project on the show. Or if you're the type of maker who tweets, you can tweet a picture of us, a picture of your project to <laughs> us at raspberry underscore pi. Before we leave everybody, please, one more time, just make sure to like and subscribe so you'll be in the know and get all the updates on all the great content on our channel. We're all about supporting young makers and educators all over the globe with fresh stuff, so don't miss out. Thank you all for being here for the Raspberry Pi Foundation's Digital Making at Home live stream. We'll be back for what will be our final weekly episode on the 30th of June for more digital making. Until then, stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you next time. Bye, everybody. Catch you later. Bye.